Thanks for listening to another episode of the Gifted Performance Podcast. If you're listening or watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe, as well as hitting the like button and the notification bell so you never miss a video. If you prefer audio format, search Gifted Performance on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcasting service and subscribe today. Make sure you also rate and review the podcast as that helps us out tremendously. Enjoy the podcast and stay gifted. Welcome back. Another episode of the Gifted Performance Podcast. I am in some straight up ethereal lighting right now. That's today's $10 word. I don't know how to make it stop. I got these like skylights in my house that are like really cool most of the time. When it rains, terrible. When it sunshines on me, also not so great. But today's a special episode, not just because of the lighting, but because we have convinced someone to come back. Most people, it's one and done. We end the recording. We say, wow, you know, Matt, that was a great recording. How did you like it? And they just instantly hang up. Like, oh, you know, must have been connection error or something like that. They're just out. Matt, good to have you back. Thanks for coming back. Good to be back, man. Um, How are you? You've been busy? Some national shows? Not Dom level busy, but you've been busy? Not quite Dom level busy, but I've I've definitely been busy. Uh, I'm taking on clients every week, pretty much. Um, nice. And then, you know, with the courses and everything else, it, it's it's keeping me busy. That's for sure. Dom, are you looking down at your phone or are you taking quick micro naps? No, <laughs> I took a picture of Matt. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, no, I just got really creepy and just took a picture of Matt without his consent. Do you want to sign my disclaimer? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Make him I'll sign the social time. media That's disclaimer. You're paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, are you are you alive? Not well, but alive. I'm fucking great, man. Good. Wow. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Came at me. I love it. Yeah, okay. yeah. I'm a little sleepy. Okay. So today, uh, you know, if you watched the last episode, which I'm assuming I'm assuming you did, it was quite a banger. People really seem to enjoy that one, Matt. They uh. A lot of shares on that one, a lot of views, a lot of, a lot of comments from people awesome. uh, that they really enjoyed it. Okay. So number two, at the end of the first one, we said we were going to do this um, and we're going to bust some myths today. But what I wanted to circle back to and maybe plug on the front end is how Masterclass number one went. So how how was it received? How did you have fun with it? What did you what did you gain? What did you learn? And then maybe we'll talk a little bit on the front end of this episode about the next one that you guys have going. Yeah, so it was awesome, man. I mean, obviously, being my first time in, in that big of an audience, we had, I think, 25 or 26 attendees. Um, and, uh, you know, one, once we got it rolling, it was just very smoothly done. Um, we did Q&As throughout the process. Um, our biggest thing was, you know, we had so much information to give. We ended up going over an hour long. So it was supposed to be two hours. And then with the Q&As, it ended up being three hours long. Um, but we covered a shit ton of topics. And, you know, my and um, my partner Gentry's goal with that course was that you left feeling that you mastered that topic. And so that was the important thing, you know, not, not a time frame or anything like that. And I do feel like we we truly accomplished that by the end. I'm I'm interested to hear what what were like the biggest questions, maybe the most recurring questions that you got from people just about the topic because the topic itself was exclusively cortisol, correct? Yeah, and you know we we talked about you know different types of stressors and different type of symptoms you you may notice because most people say I'm not stressed. So we had to like show them that not everything is a perceived stress. Um, and then we talked about, you know, um, the hormone adaptations and stuff like that. We showed them some examples of blood work, uh, of different red flags you might have of somebody who's dealing with stress and inflammation. So we had some questions about that type of stuff. Um, questions on how to mitigate these things. We, we did two different uh, portions we did uh, how to mitigate stress for a lifestyle client and also how to mitigate stress and stuff for a contest prep client um, and that that's where a lot of questions came in with regards to contest prep because obviously you still want to try to lose weight but you're also trying to limit stressors as much as possible 
So we, we talked in detail about that. Um, and I'd say that's probably where most of the questions came in. And then, of course, we had some questions about supplementation style stuff. Everyone yeah. wants that, the, the supplement answer, you know. I heard you mentioned lifestyle change. I heard you mentioned maybe diet less, do less cardio. But hear me out. What supplements can I take instead? Right. That's got to be the biggest frustrating piece for you. Like, I just gave you the 95% of the equation, and you're just skipping over that. Let me get that. Let me get that last 5%. It's hard. You know, we, we can all, we, we all get into that mindset, you know, one way or another, that we're, we're looking for that, that quick answer, that easy answer. Um, but, yeah, it's just reminding people that there's a lot more to it than, than just throw, throwing, you know, a new supplement in the mix. Now, what can everyone expect on the second one? Because the second one is all about reading blood work, correct? Yeah, so a, a little bit different of a topic. And, and you know, I, we had multiple topics that we were willing to do, and we actually did a poll online to see what people were most interested in next. And, you know, most people voted for blood work. I think I myself had like two, 150 to 200 votes on blood work. So we chose to do that one. And then as we started getting going with it, we realized – this is a shit ton of information again, and we don't want to go over. So we split up into two parts. Uh, part one is going to be a little bit more generalized. It's just kind of going top to bottom of a comprehensive lab work, um, your normal ranges versus optimal ranges, and, and kind of differentiating the two between that, um, explaining what each little thing is and what it, what it actually means to be, um, you know, out of that range. Um, and then we're probably going to touch a little bit on ways to mitigate certain things, um, you know, elevated liver enzymes and stuff like that, cholesterol issues, um, little things like that. And then part two will be more focused on bigger, bigger applications such as hormone imbalances, um, high inflammation, you know, pre-diabetes and insulin resistance, that type of stuff. So, That's a question know, for the entire group. It's going to be beneficial, but the first one's going to be more of introducing people to lab work, and the second will be a lot more in-depth. Um, and I don't want to say that to steer people away from, you know, part one, because I do think most people need that. You know, when when we think about the general consensus of what competitors look at for lab work, most people know AST, ALT, and testosterone. You know, that, that's like the, the three that they know. Maybe maybe some people have an understanding of the lipid panel, but that's that's kind of pushing it from there. Does my liver work? Do my balls work? Yeah. A competitor checklist. <laughs> that's One it. and two right there. Yeah. So here's kind of a question for the whole group that I've been thinking about lately because, you know, I see, and maybe it's just the people that I've followed recently, but I see a lot of people, coaches in particular, saying, you know, send like, advocating for their clients to send blood work to them. You know, your physician isn't going to be able to interpret this correctly. Where do you guys draw that line of like interpreting blood work to where you're not overstepping your boundaries and doing the job of someone who maybe has MD after their name? Where is that line for you? Because I think it's pretty murky for some people. Some will say, I'll look at it. I'll advise you. Others are like, send it to me and only me. Don't ever go to the doctor. I can fix you all myself. You don't need doctors anymore. Uh. I think it, I think it probably like my doctor is really well versed. So like he, I feel like if you have a doctor who is versed in athletics, you might have a better chance of um, being able to have them interpret it as well. Um, just because like we know there's markers that you know are elevated um, in athletes that aren't usually elevated in like normal well, population. Um, you know, and then like even my doctor, like he'll suggest not training before blood work a couple days because he knows that that can throw off markers. Yeah. Um, but then again, like there's some, you know, GPs that just have never worked with an athlete, don't understand these things, um, you know, and like, uh, like I have an example of a client who um, had high cholesterol. Uh, and it was just instantly, let's put you on Lipitor. 
but in reality it was post prep um you know other things were in the equation and it was more along the line that's that's where i would like to step in and suggest hey why don't you follow some sort of health protocol for six seven weeks then get this redone and i guarantee you probably aren't going to need lipitor yeah so um i feel like i feel like you kind of have to vet the the physician's um history on working with athletes specifically um and, you know and then like you know there's so many things that throw off blood work too like not being hydrated enough beforehand can raise hematocrit falsely you know we know it affects hemoglobin all those things and i guess those are all something that you want to make sure the physician understands without insulting them of course but you know at the end of the day they are mds they're a lot yeah. more you know a lot more knowledgeable than the majority of us but there are parts of it where it's kind of just checking off a list to them because i've yeah. seen it multiple times where it's like oh your your tsh is normal no bro 0 0.9 is not normal just because it is in this range of normal yeah. doesn't mean it's normal but that's why it's hard to in my opinion it's hard to gauge that because i have a really good doctor um who knows all those things but then there's some where i've came into contact with and i'm just like man you're like your doctor thinks this is normal <laughs> I think a big part of that too is, you know, I, I try to remind people and, you know, don't get me wrong. I, I, I'm not talking down about doctors whatsoever. Uh, I agree with them. I, I like to hear their perspective and then kind of give my own perspective and, and almost combine the two. But like you said, it definitely depends on, you know, their experience with athletes, but also keep in mind that as the athletes coach, we have a much better idea of what's going on in the background than this doctor who's literally just looking at a paper, doesn't know anything about the person, um, e even to the point of, you know, the person just got out of a contest prep. So there's going to be things off. Um, but I think it's also important to remember, like, with to Dom's point about the normal levels, um, doctors are very busy people and their main, their number one job is to keep us alive. Keeping us alive is very different than keeping us optimized. And so that that's actually a big part of what we talk about in, in this next course, too, is the difference between optimal ranges and normal ranges, because doctors don't have enough time to dedicate to every single person like, OK, this is how we're going to optimize X, Y and Z for you. You know, they just don't want you to die. Yeah. Paul, where's that where's that line for you? Well, for me, is it? I like to be very careful because we have a certain scope legally that we're not supposed to cross into, you know? So, I mean, luckily I haven't had a ton of situations of like, you know, scary blood work, but let's say something does come back scary. Like I'm always like, Hey, you, like we may try this or do this, but like also you should go see your doctor and see if you need to see a specialist or get some sort of follow up. And then, you know, I'll be like, Hey, in uh, four to eight weeks or however long, we're going to redo some blood work. But yeah, definitely try. I, I remember that it is not our job to diagnose and, you know, try and fix certain things, you know. So uh, but you're right. It is tough with doctors. And, you know, I've had situations where a client has gotten blood work and, you know, maybe uh, I think that their thyroid protocol with their doctor could be improved. And I'll be like, Hey, um, mention this to your doctor, see what he thinks. And, you know, a lot of times it works out and the doctor's like, yeah, we can try a little more T4 or whatever. And then they come back and things are better. So. Yeah. And to that, I, point, um, I, I wanted to add in there that, you know, I, I like Dom has, um, you know, his doctor that he trusts a lot. I have my functional physician, so, so to Paul's point, if there are things that are, you know, more than just the, the normal stuff that I see, I usually refer to him at, at, from a from an MD standpoint as to, hey, hey, doc, how alarmed should we be about this type of stuff? And if I already don't have an explanation for it, he can usually help me out. Um, but but even to that point, you know, if there is a disagreement with doctors about 
a good example of the thyroid protocol when it comes to medications. I'm not qualified to be medicating someone. So at that point, I say, look, you know, I think you should go for a second opinion. And I set them up with my doctor, who I know I'm very, you know, in line with. And so that's kind of how I approach that type of situation. But we definitely we need, we need MDs involved. You know, there, there's at no point to your to what you originally said, Ryan, at no point should someone be like, disregard doctors. You never need a doctor again. I got this. That's, that's the year crazy. is 2013. I'm venturing to the UCF Health Clinic <laughs> for some routine blood work. My AST and my ALT come back in like the 50 to 60 range. The doctor looks at me like I'm actually going to pass away at any moment. And he says, are you using any, any drugs? And I made an admission. I told him, you know, I was using Oxandrolone at the time in my younger years. You know, 10 lashes for using illegal drugs back in the day right. I was taking. And I told him, you know, taking 50 milligrams of Anavar. And he looked at me like his world had just come down around him. And he said, is that weekly? And I said, no, that's daily. And he writes it down, scribbles it really quick, bolts out the door, comes back. He's like, I've scheduled you blood work, another round of blood work. I've scheduled you an ultrasound for your liver. Oh I've God. scheduled, I, I, I've written you a script for this, you know, to, oh, 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 over the counter. You know, you got to go get it as soon as possible. We have to get, we have to see these numbers come down as soon as possible. And I was like, oh my God, like I am legitimately going to die. I think I called my mom and I was like, something's wrong with my liver. I think he mentioned like hepatitis or something. I think I might have hepatitis. I think I killed myself. I think that I'm doomed. Went home, did some Google research. I was like, oh, training elevates liver enzymes. So I called the doctor and I was like, hey, I'm going to take three days off from training. I'm going to come back in and I think my enzymes will be down. And he told me under no circumstance <laughs> would those levels come down. There was not a fucking chance in hell that those numbers were going to come down. And I said, doc, I, I know I have hepatitis. I know I'm passing away. I've already I got my will. I got, you know, three people that I think will write me a really good eulogy. Took my three days off, went, bla went back, got my blood work, liver enzymes back in the normal range. And he was like, this is, this is a medical, like a medical miracle. Like this doesn't happen. Like no one comes back from an AST of 52. It's impossible. And I was healed by the hand of God. That yeah. was my experience. I'm surprised. Uh, I'm surprised a CMP doesn't have a GGT test on it. I'm surprised by that too. Because Can you explain that for people who might AS, not know? An AST and ALT. Like, yeah, they're very particular to the liver, but other pieces of tissue give those off. And yeah, a GGT is more, a more accurate scope of how your liver is actually doing. Yeah, like I'm like even like a cystatin C, like I'm surprised those things are not on. Oh, hang on. I got somebody at the door. Uh Oh, it's Charlie. Mr. Defending us. All right. Well, let's get into some of the actual questions, some of the myths today. So see, these are some of the things that I've seen kind of floating around the Instagramosphere of myths that I think kind of fall into your scope um, of things that you deal with on a daily basis. The first one that I see quite a bit, and it has really kind of like skyrocketed in popularity. I think some big name coaches have started talking a lot about um, blood glucose, monitoring your blood glucose and your insulin sensitivity. And then kind of the pushback from that is that individuals who are lean and highly active. So people that we would consider like bodybuilders, they stay relatively lean year round, some not as much as others. Um, and they're physically active, you know, resistance training 90 minutes, six, seven times a week doing some cardio. So the pushback is individuals who are physically active and lean don't need to worry about monitoring their blood glucose or their insulin sensitivity, because those are just going to naturally be in a normal range. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, obviously, I think it, it might be safe to say that a leaner individual is less likely to have blood glucose dysregulation compared to an obese person. But it, with that being said, you know, the, the saying, don't judge a book by its cover, uh, you know, comes full circle here because um, there's a lot more involved with blood glucose regulation than how much body fat somebody has. You know, stress and inflammation 
are major drivers of glucose dysregulation. And a lean person can can have stress and inflammation just as much as, you know, an obese person. Obviously, an obese person can have more because of their obesity, but plenty of lean people, you know, if their circadian rhythm is, is off, if their sleep schedule is bad, excuse me, they're dehydrated, they're under-recovered, all of those things can affect um, blood glucose and insulin sensitivity. Um, and, you know, me, myself... I run into a lot of these functional cases where there's this phenomenon of people who stay lean um, and look in great shape, like they look like they're competing right now. They're in such great shape um, and they can lose weight. They can build muscle. The exterior is perfectly fine, but the interior is truly falling apart. They have multiple autoimmune disorders. They have bacteria overgrowth in their gut. Their limbs are turning blue. They're basically diabetics. Um, you know, these things are, are happening to lean individuals all the time. So we really can't just base it off of the exterior like that. Um, and, and with that being said, you know, there, there's been research shown that even lean people, the guys and girls who can stay lean year round, doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't accumulating fat. They might be accumulating less subcutaneous fat, but they might be accumulating more visceral fat. And so the fat is still accumulating. And and so, again, we can't just judge by, just because a guy has abs, we can't say, oh, he's got good insulin sensitivity. You know, visceral fat is uh, particularly troublesome. I just want to throw I, my my sort of thing with the my pushback for the insulin thing and or uh, blood glucose monitoring is that a lot of people will just get labs right You're like three months six month whatever and fasting blood glucose is a little high fasting insulin is a little high and that's it they just people have gotten so myopic about it and they freak out and there's a bunch of fear mongering and they're like we have to fix all this shit and it's like. It's one set of lab at like one time point in your life. Like right. hemoglobin A1C was fine. It's like maybe get a few sets of labs before we freak out and start changing things. Um, Cause you know, and, and labs make mistakes. I had a buddy go get a lab and um, his fasting glucose was 300 and something. I was like, that is alarming and troublesome. Mm-hmm. This is really weird though. Cause you're really lean. I was like, you should get a follow-up lab, a couple of them. They both came back at like 80, huh. 83. You know, like labs make mistakes. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. And, um, you know, that that's why I think monitoring it consistently, like obviously you can't monitor their fasted insulin, their hemoglobin A1C, but, you know, tracking fasted glucose and post-workout glucose and even just um, glucose one and a half, two hours after meals, you have a pretty good idea of how their body is handling things. Um, and obviously to, to Paul's point, it, if they're making progress and we're just seeing numbers slightly elevated, like insulin's a little bit higher than normal, their fast of glucose is a little bit higher than normal. That's not something that I'm going to take major time to address immediately. Um, especially if their physique is improving. But if we have someone who has come through a couple coaches and they can't lose fat no matter what they do, and they're actually showing, you know, they're like, what the fuck is wrong with me? Then it might be something worth addressing. Absolutely, dude. And uh, my, my pushback, too, is a lot because, I mean, there are a lot of coaches these days that like one set of blood work, one set of bad numbers. And they're like immediately they're like, use my discount code for revive, you know, like. And just load them up. Yeah. So I think that's a good segue right there is that like when people do get those bad labs back, it's immediately the supplement push, right? It's so if we, so if we rule, let's rule out things that have like a really big impact here, like the pharmaceuticals, things like metformin, let's let, let's completely rule out metformin here and just look at the purely over the counter side of things. Um, I think GDAs, uh, glucose disposal agents, are very popular supplements. Um, The jury's kind of out there, though, on what the impact of those actually is long term. Um, I'm interested to hear, is that something that you have your 
uh, clients use case by case basis. Everyone kind of uses it to help out. Um, what's your opinion there on supplements? Case by case. And to your point, you know, it, it comes down to, again, finding out why, why their insulin sensitivity is off. You know, if they've just been bulking for six months, then it's just time to stop bulking. You know, uh, if it's a matter of them getting four hours of sleep every night, well, then a GDA ain't going to fucking help. And neither is metformin for that matter. You need to fix your sleep schedule. So it's it's usually addressing the root causes. But obviously, you know, something like a GDA can be can assist in that process of improving things um, where I where I kind of lean towards those the most is if I see facet insulin is very elevated. Like we know for a fact that they are insulin resistant. That would be when I really implement something like metformin plus GDAs just to get the process moving a bit quicker. Um, but most of the time it's going to be lifestyle adjustments over, over supplementation. Um, and, you know, I think there, there's been some research shown that GDAs don't always necessarily help the situation. You know, some of them, are insulin mimetics, so they mimic insulin, and so some uh, I, I believe in some forms GDAs can actually store fat uh, from carbohydrates just as much as they you know replenish glycogen in the muscle. So it's not always as simple as just like take this GDA and you're going to be good. So I'm not sure if it was Revive supplement. Um, who? So here's a question. Have you guys seen the ads for Revive where it's like obvious that someone else wrote the caption for them? It's like, here's this supplement and here's how it works. And it's like this big, long thing about like how all the various ingredients work. And it's like, you didn't write that. Like, I'm right. not sure that you can even spell your name. I don't think that you wrote this caption. I read one of them that was like, uh, this is like my favorite one that I heard about GDAs. It was like, it's like you ingested it and it like makes the carbs go away. And I was like, that's it. <laughs> You nailed it. It yeah, just man. it just makes them go away. Goodbye. Yeah. Yeah, I know a lot of different products are are coined like car blockers. And it's like, what the fuck is a car blocker? You ever heard uh you know the comedian Cat Williams? Yeah. He had a uh, he had like something about like fat blockers, like it's in the back of your throat and it's like, mm, nope, not in here, not today. But those those fat blockers were the funniest, like Olestra, because it just like wouldn't let the fat digest. And then you would just like shit out straight oil. And people that were was, like, so that was the um, what was that peanut butter that uh, the nut, the professor nuts? Yeah, that, that was yeah. their whole spiel with that was like zero calorie peanut butter because you just shit it out. out. <laughs> and it's like that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Like those Alestra commercials came on, they're like, we put this in potato chips, and it's like, side effects include oily flatulence. <laughs> you can't sneak in oily flatulence. That You gotta announce that from the start, because that's bad. No one wants that. No one wants canola oil in their drawers at the end of the day. Jesus. Uh, Dom, anything you wanted to add on, you know, blood glucose monitoring that you've seen? Um, maybe some supplements around it, ridiculous claims around it, anything like that? You're on mute, by the way. Uh, no, this guy's going crazy right now. Um, Charles. No, not too much. Matt pretty much nailed it pretty well. Um, but, like, I've used... Like, I take, I take metformin every day. I do, um, too. I take it every night before bed. Uh, it's helped control a lot of my stuff. I, I would normally run higher blood fasting glucose, even if I was super dieted. Like, I'd still run, like, an 80 in the towards the end of prep um oh here's a here's a here's a follow-up question for you that everyone can kind of attack what are what are some of the people because people may not know this what are some of the side effects that like uh the bad things that can happen if you do allow glucose um or insulin to run high for extended periods of time if you allow glucose and insulin to basically run high unchecked well you can become a diabetic that's kind yeah. of bad <laughs> that's bad um the, it, the excess insulin floating around in your body it's pretty much going to prevent fat loss and you're just going to be storing fat throughout the day. Um, and you also, I think will have much higher amounts of inflammation because of that as well. Um, I, mean, I, I think also, you know, I'm starting to see 
a lot of situations of hyperinsulinemia where people have, you know, too much insulin. And then um, whether it's a stress response or a response to eating food, they then go hypoglycemic and crash throughout the day at random births. Bursts. And, you know, for whatever reason, people in the fitness world would think, oh, this is because I'm just so lean and my metabolism is so great right now. But in reality, it's like, well, no, you have some major glucose and insulin issues going on in the background, you know? That's, a, that's an interesting parallel to draw right there. I'm so lean right now. My metabolism must be so high. Right. Like, no, those two don't exist at the same time, friend. Yeah, they're like excited that they're going hypo five times a day. And like, <laughs> they're, they're not even recognizing that they're probably on their way to being, you know, type one diabetic in the next couple of years. Well, and then some of those people try to fix it themselves with like, self-prescribing like lantis or or like a longer you know something like that and then and then some of them do end up becoming pretty much diabetic because of that yeah yeah well another big one is um you know some people think they, they like mask it with the with the keto diet and, and so they're like as long as i don't eat carbs i never go hypo and it's just like well clearly there's a reaction going on and you should probably address that and not just avoid it for the rest of your life. Well, and that's kind of when, when you look into uh, like diabetes and type two diabetes and stuff, a lot of people think that it's carb driven, but actually it, there, there's an accumulation of basically partially metabolized fat. You don't have all the tools that you need to complete full me, um, metabolization of fat, I guess. So those byproducts accumulate in the cell and interfere with other things. And so, I mean, that's like one thing I like to consider whenever uh, there's a situation where it's like, okay, like maybe fasting glucose is getting a little high or maybe fasting insulin is getting a little high. Like most of us sit on our ass all day long outside of training. And it's like, hey, do we have time to like maybe go for like 20 minute walks in the morning can we like, or maybe just a little bit of cardio post-workout, can you like just try to move a little more over the day? Like instead of getting 2,000 steps a day, can we aim, let's start small and add two or 3,000 on top of that and then keep trying to push it up? Because there is some research too showing like how, how much uh, metabolically more unhealthy people are when they uh, fall below a certain yeah. uh, range of steps or whatever and how bad they are at uh you know, um, just using fat for fuel and training. Even was it uh was it yeah. that Ben House podcast I sent you where they were talking about like healthy weight metabolic disorder people? I think they did. They did mention it there. I was looking at some stuff the other day too. No, I, I, I agree with you, Paul. And that's you know that's a great point that I completely didn't touch on. But you know, that going back to the, the question about you know GDAs and stuff, it's been scientifically proven that. A 10 to 15 minute walk after meals is more beneficial than metformin, GDAs, or any other type of, you know, uh, supplemental, uh, you know, thing for insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance. So that's, that's something that I do incorporate a lot is, like you said, you know, a fast walk. I, I do a fasted two mile walk every morning um, just to kind of get outside and get in the sunlight. Um, but I'll have people do walks after meals throughout the day too um it not only to help with you know the the um the blood glucose thing but just to your point just being more active if they work a nine to five at a desk and they're only getting in two three thousand steps a day simply cranking that up to six or eight thousand can make a pretty big difference huge no, yeah because it's super i mean when you think about it man like most people like they commute to work, they sit at a desk all day, they commute back, maybe they work out for an hour or two, and then they come home, make dinner, sit around and watch TV, go to sleep. And it's like, wow, you didn't move very much for like 22 out of the 24 hours in that day. <laughs> and even even the resistance training section of it is such a small piece of activity because it's, you know, it's 20 sets. Maybe if they're doing like a hard workout, you know, 10 reps, like 
Okay, how much total work have you done? You've done what? Twenty minutes, maybe. If each set took That's you sixty seconds to complete, yeah. Especially each if set you're doing machine like isolation machines and stuff. Yeah, yeah. You're not even doing full body. Uh, I think people overstate work. overstate the protective nature of just resistance training on its own in an effort to kind of like circumvent the fact that they need to do some sort of cardiorespiratory training movement as a whole. Yeah. Just because they no, don't want to do it. And to Paul's point, you know, these people are so sedentary every day. And something that's really gotten on my nerves in the past year with with COVID and stuff. Now they do, uh, you know, grocery delivery service and you can like pick up outside the store. And I think about it all the time. I've said this to my girlfriend. I've said like, you know, these people shopping for groceries might literally be the most activity that some people do all day. And now they're yeah. taking that away. So That's now they're 1500 steps, right? Now they can't even walk with a car and, and, you know, pick out their vegetables. It's just, we're creating such a lazy, uh, set. Nah, they're not, nah, they're not getting vegetables. They're not getting vegetables. <laughs> yeah. I was going to get an organic Oreos. Vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that shit is so tempting. But another thing uh, to throw out too, is like, it's Paul's so, like, I use that all the time. That's my I favorite. Know, I, I love grocery <laughs> delivery. <laughs> He's the grocery right. delivery. Paul's like, oh, it's so tempting. I just want to use it. <laughs> Dude, yeah. I, I see it whenever I see Amazon, and I'm like, I wonder if they have fun cereals. And it's like, deliver to your house in less than two hours. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> um, but I can't justify it yet. But anyways, uh, you're because even your heart, when you don't uh, move, like your heart works harder all day long because there's the the muscle pump, which returns venous blood flow, you know? So, I mean, even just for cardio protective reasons, and and even if you're not actually doing cardio cardio, you know, and you're just lightly walking like that helps a lot in itself. I think Stan Efforting was one of those first people to really push that, at least in the fitness community. You know, he came out with a vertical diet and he started really pushing the walks and talked about how in um, in um, in India, that that's a big thing. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but they do walks after every meal and that they're significantly healthier people. Their cholesterol levels, their their insulin resistance, all that stuff is significantly better. And they live longer lives in comparison to Americans. And he was just putting a lot of um, emphasis into those those walks throughout the day. Yeah, his thing is you, you take a 10-minute walk after every meal you eat. That's it. Yeah. And it might not be anything magic in the actual duration of the walk post-meal. It's just right. that you're accumulating more activity throughout the day. So if you're having six meals, you know, you're getting 60 minutes of walking in for the day. Right. And not only that, but there is something to distributing exercise over a day yes. for your health. Yes. You know, and, and there is research showing that uh, just training for an hour block is not as good as moving that around throughout the whole day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't even think you don't even have to look outside of the United States for an example of the walking being a way to control body weight. You can look at cities where there's more of like a walking built into their lifestyle, yeah, like places stuff. like New York, Boston, where people yeah. are moving around more and you can just track overall weight trends for the entire state. And what you'll see is a lower average body weight. They might not be guys, healthier because like, of some other like, things that they do in their life in New York right. and these big cities. But yeah, at least they're maintaining a lower body weight. Did you well, guys just like decide that. to talk about me before like I, I stepped away? Yeah, you left and we were like, like all right, life. let's shit talk Dom yeah, as much as possible. Shame, shame. Shame. <laughs> I do walk oh. more now because we have the house. Oh. I actually walk have to up go and up down and stairs. downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but not only not only from like, you know, a weight loss and, and stuff per, uh, perspective, but also just you know, in the past year and or two years now, you know, with the whole COVID situation, vitamin D became like a, a much bigger topic with immune system health and stuff. So just getting outdoors throughout the day and getting some natural vitamin D is obviously extremely beneficial for everyone's health. Um, and also it's been, I don't know if any of you guys uh, follow the uh, Huberman uh, lab podcast, uh, but he actually did one um, sometime last year where he talked about how 
sensory stuff in the eyes affect uh, cortisol and mood and stuff. And he talked about how progressive forward motion, just the, the act of actually moving forward, en- enhances your mood and it makes you feel like you're more productive and more progressive. So you That's know, one that I had not heard. When we even talk about, you know, I have clients who have treadmills at home. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. But I'd really like you to get outside for that 10 minute walk and actually, you know, get some sunlight and get that progressive forward motion. What's funny is Dom had Dom and I had uh, we interviewed a, a World of Warcraft streamer on the podcast because he like kind of like crosses over between wow and like fitness. Uh-huh. And he talks about this stuff. He calls it like doing your dailies. He's like, you know, you should be doing some sort of activity to that every day, like walking, go out for a walk. Like you have to like socialize daily, get that interaction with someone else so you can get that like dopamine of like communicating with another person, like spend some time outside, get some sunlight directly on your skin. And I'm like, do you have like a bachelor's in exercise science or exercise physiology or something? Or are you just like a World of Warcraft guy? Because you're kind of you're kind of spitting some hot fire right now in terms of like health improvement. It's like the most responsible wild player in the world. You remember when that first came out and like. You were hearing about like babies dying of neglect because people <laughs> were just like play wow for weeks straight or something. Yep. All right. We have hit one organ in the body talking about glucose. We're hitting that. We hit the pancreas. Let's move along to the adrenals. So again, two very polarized sides of this argument here. Um, so, you know, I've heard people talk about adrenals can be ignored. They're adaptable. They downregulate and upregulate based on needs. So, you know, just ignore those and let them handle themselves. Um, I think the biggest piece of literature that everyone quotes, I see Alan Aragon post this all the time, and it is a systematic review of the literature. And the title, I don't want to get the title wrong. I have it pulled up so I wouldn't get it wrong because the title is hilarious. The I've never seen a piece of literature titled like this before. It just says adrenal fatigue does not exist. That is the that's the entire title of the piece of the systematic review. It's so like, that's what the people on one side quote, and then others on the other side. Um, I even have a client who has does he have adrenal fatigue tattooed on his? He got like diagnosed when he was younger, so he got like adrenal fatigue tattooed down the side of him. So he would be on the other side where it's like definitely need to worry about it, definitely need to monitor it. Matt, yeah. I'm interested to hear where you kind of fall, probably neatly in the middle uh yeah well i mean i I actually suffer adrenal insufficiency myself i've got multiple 24-hour cortisol labs done urine and saliva tests and my body does underproduce cortisol i've seen a lot of functional athletes who are completely flatlined not producing any cortisol um and obviously i've seen the opposite i've seen people overproducing cortisol significantly So obviously, I I do believe um, that it is a real thing. I think that, you know, people argue about the the actual verbiage and and adrenal fatigue They you know, a lot of people argue about that verbiage and like to, I think most people prefer to use the verbiage adrenal insufficiency. I don't really know that there's that much of a difference between those two (laughs) phrases, but um, I do know that people tend to go more towards the insufficiency side of things. Um, I think that's because when when we talk about adrenal fatigue, people kind of tend to make it sound like a permanent thing, like you are fucked for life, your adrenals are never coming back type of deal. Whereas with the idea of adrenal insufficiency, it's just showing that there's an, an adaptation has happened and now your body is underproducing cortisol. However, this can be remedied through, you know, lifestyle changes, time and stuff like that. For the most part, there there might be people that actually need to be medicated with, with, you know, exogenous cortisol or or whatever they might medicate. Uh, But for the most part, it's the, the thing that we see with adrenal insufficient people is they've been, they've either dealt with PTSD or trauma or they've had chronically high stress for so long, their adrenals have been producing exorbitant amounts of cortisol for so long that now it's underproducing. And so by calming them down and supporting that adrenal with some adaptogens and stuff like that, you can bring levels back to a healthy range. 
So I think that that's where the discrepancy is, is, you know, nothing is necessarily finite. And that's the same thing with metabolic damage. You know, we stopped using that term metabolic damage and we started using the term adaptation because that's really what it was. Yeah, I think uh, there's this pushback always happens, right? Because there's always, you know, a, a term that gets started and a bunch of assholes talk about it that shouldn't be talking about it. Yeah. And then the more scientific people or more, I guess, people who are into the literature and that, that, that type of evidence and such, they're just like, well, this doesn't exist. This is not a medical diagnosis. This isn't a thing. And then it's like, well, but maybe like just because they're not at an extreme end that you can call it a disease state like Cushing's or something – like, does not mean it doesn't exist and isn't something that maybe needs to be addressed and could be optimized a little bit? And like you said, not always through drugs and, you know, or supplements, but also through lifestyle change, you know? Yeah, yeah uh, you know, a lot of that can, can just be t- just too much accumulated stress, you know, or, or inflammation for that matter, be it one or the two. Um, so, so improving those things. And just giving some support, whether it be, you know, minerals, vitamins, um, you know, a few things that I've used um, are adaptogens like cordyceps, mushrooms, um, lion's mane, you know, nootropics and stuff like that. Those things can, can help bring things back into a range. And now I don't know if, how familiar you guys have been with the, the newer supplements, but now with, you know, thyroid and adrenal supplementation, they have glandulars which are derived from like bovine glands and it's more of a natural approach, so to speak. Um, You can't really use that with autoimmune cases, but in general population, they can be utilized to help boost that, that production too. So I've used supplements like that, that have adrenal glandulars in them. And I mean, I noticed a difference right away, right away. Yeah. When you're, when you're looking at, so let's say a client comes to you and, you believe that they are suffering from adrenal insufficiency. Um, Are you just looking at that 24 hour cortisol test on blood work? Uh, What are some of the things that maybe stick out to you that make you say, all right, you know, this is most likely adrenal insufficiency. Yeah. So um, we go over, you know, obvious symptoms and there's going to be a lot more involved than just the, the adrenal portion of it. Um, You know, the, the adrenals, thyroid, and reproductive hormones all kind of work in a trilogy. So when one thing is off, you're oftentimes going to see other things off. Um, we'll see the thyroid work harder and, and try to produce more thyroid because the adrenals are underproducing. Um, and we can see, you know, sex hormones be dysregulated because of that uh, underproduction as well. Um, the adrenals play a major role in glucose regulation. So very often, you know, to my point before, when a lot of adrenal insufficient people have um, high insulin and blood glucose dysregulations, those are most of the people that I see with the hyperinsulinemia where they're, um, they're crashing and going hypoglycemic throughout the day. Those are lower cortisol people. That I see. So there's multiple things in play there that are kind of giving us an idea. But the 24 hour cortisol is a really good tool to show us, okay, this person is either not producing at all, all day in 24 hour period, or maybe they're underproducing in the morning, but overproducing at night. And so we call that a flop circadian rhythm, where, you know, sometimes people who work night shifts and stuff can get into that where they're they're spiking at nighttime and then crash in the morning where it should be the opposite. Um, so in that case, that's not adrenal insufficiency. That's just a flop circadian rhythm. And we just have to work on changing their sleep habits and stuff. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder if I was, when I was working security, working nights, working security, very stressful. I wonder if I had that flop circadian. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if I did. Yeah, the the the, co- the the coin term for that is the wired and tired. You okay. know, you're, you're kind of you're yeah. dependent on caffeine all morning and all day to get you through the day, but then you're exhausted at night, but your brain just doesn't stop going. Yeah, that sounds, that, that, sounds that, about that's right. The flop circadian rhythm. Okay, 
All right, number three for the episode. This one might be a little bit bigger one. Um, this one is uh, missing your menstrual cycle. So it's around the menstrual cycle. Um, last three to four months of prep, perfectly normal to miss your menstrual cycle. And perfectly normal, part of the process for it to take, you know, months on end after the show for it to come back. I've seen a lot of, a lot of coaches advocate this for this, tell this to their female clients. You know, hey, losing your menstrual cycle is part of the process and not getting it back is completely normal. Um, I even had a physician tell one of my clients who had been, uh, who had missed her cycle for four months unrelated to contest prep. And the OBGYN said, oh, it's perfectly normal. Happens to people all the time. So just kind of centered around missing that menstrual cycle. Well, you know, um, for the most part, you know, I'll start off by saying I hate using the term normal. And I think most functional um, health people kind of cringe when doctors use that term normal. I think it's explain it can be explained, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's normal or OK. Um, we, we see menstrual cycles stop um, because hormones are downregulated. You know, whether it be progesterone or estrogen or both, um, this could be due to them being that lean. But most of the time, it's due to what we talked about last episode with regards to over dieting, over training and, and stress, uh, pulling away that that progesterone uh, and lowering reproductive hormones. So in regards to, you know, three to four weeks out from prep, that to me, that that is not optimal. And I'll put it like that, because we know that we need those reproductive hormones for healthy metabolic function. So four months out of prep, that's the entire prep. If their metabolism isn't functioning yeah. properly at four months out, we're going to have a fucking rough road ahead of us going into this show. So that to me would already be a red flag that we're probably going to have some the metabolic resistance and some roadblocks going on. Um, now, if we're seeing results, I'm not going to worry about it. Um, but if we start, stop seeing results and we're not having menstrual cycles, then I, it's clear as day, like it, this is obviously, you know, hindering us and we should probably get labs and talk about postponing the show and addressing this stuff first. Um, as far as post show, what, what I would say is, an optimal situation would be keeping it till the last month, keeping it till about four weeks out that last month, four to six weeks out. I think that that would be optimal. Um, I think it's reasonable to assume that at some point they're going to lose it because they're that lean. Um, and obviously, you know, the supplements that they might be taking will have an effect there. Um, but if they're losing it beforehand, then we know that they're not optimizing fat loss. So I would say the last four to six weeks would be reasonable. And then I would say two months post-show, it should be back in range by then because we're feeding them up. We're hopefully supporting um, those reproductive hormones and getting them healthy again. So for me, when it comes to a female's metabolic health, that's one thing that I am paying attention to post-show is you know, how, how, how soon are they getting that back? And if it's been four months, I'd say we, we've done something wrong. Um, if it still hasn't come back in four months since the show. Uh, but usually within two months, I'm having most people get lab work. So I, would, I probably would never let it get to four months. How much, how much does the division that the individual competes in influence those time frames? Would it be different for a bikini competitor versus a women's physique competitor? I certainly think so, mainly because conditioning and how, how lean they are, for one part, uh, how much stress they put on their body because of that conditioning. I would, it's safe to say a women's physique competitor is going to be doing more um, than a bikini girl to get in shape. Um, and then, of course, the PEDs, you know, it – if they're if they're crashing their estrogen levels with chemicals, then that's going to play a major role in it. Um, and you know, certain anabolics can exacerbate that that progesterone uh, out of balance ratio. So um, I certainly think that the division is going to going to play a role in that. 
Um, but at the end of the day, whatever the division is, I still think that women can have a healthy cycle for the most part till to the very end of a play. Especially post show. I think most women you can correct me if I'm wrong here. Uh PEDs removed from the equation. Most women probably settle around uh like a pretty similar body fat in the off season. The differentiator is gonna be that in season conditioning requirement of the specific division. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say, um, you know, every girl kind of has their, their happy range for their homeostasis for body fat and stuff like that. I would say the, the big determining factor or differentiating factor would be their protocols and prep and also, you know, lifestyle factors with that. You know, if gut health is off, if their liver health is off, the liver plays a major role in, the conversion and metabolization of those hormones. So, you know, if a girl finishes her prep, let's say it wasn't even a, a, an intense prep. She wasn't stacking PEDs. She wasn't doing all that. But she finishes the prep and she goes drinking, you know, four times a week and causes a lot of liver stress. That's going to impact her, her, um, her reproductive hormones as well. So that's another factor in there along with stress, and stuff like that. So there are a, a few different factors in play, but if you're doing, if, if, if the coach is doing a responsible reverse diet protocol, not, a lot of those factors should be removed. You shouldn't be stressing the athlete. You should be, you know, slowly but reasonably increasing calories, fat and carbs. Um, they shouldn't be doing a ton of cardio at this point, and they should be off the PEDs for the most part. So, you know, as long as you're checking off all those boxes, they, they should come back pretty, pretty soon. Matt, I'll have, you know, that bodybuilders are serious athletes. They don't mess around in the off season and they would never ever think about go drinking four right. days a week. Alcohol, the devil's right. tonic. I don't right. think so, sir. <laughs> Paul, what were you going to say? I think I kind of interrupted you. Uh, I, I'm good. I feel like you guys hit all the major. And I mean, I just think the the biggest consideration is is considering that everybody's an individual, you know, and some people are going to lose it sooner than others. Trying to keep it as long as you can, and like Matt said, if you lose it super duper early, uh, or I'm not going to say in every situation that's bad, you know, but it yeah. probably isn't. It, it's not what you want or want to be the norm for sure, you know, and. We we're taught you guys were talking about how well, like, will it be worse for a bikini competitor and a, a woman or a women's physique competitor? And I was just thinking to myself, we should be replacing will with like should because we've all just seen all this horrible stuff. I mean, I don't want to say it's all like I don't want to demonize everything and, and say everything's always bad, but I mean, we we've seen awful protocols where like people bikini girls are, you know taking more things than they probably need or should and then doing way more cardio than they probably need or should four or five months out. Um, so, yeah. I think it's like a don't go, don't go chasing it, right? Don't be like, oh, lost my cycle. Now prep's getting real. Like now we're, now we're getting there. Yeah, I think a lot, uh, not a lot, but I think, that, you know, in my experience, newer competitors and even newer coaches look at that as a good thing because they yeah. assume she's getting so lean that she's no longer having to cycle. So they're like happy about it and like celebrate that. Oh man. Yeah. She's getting shredded now because she's lost her cycle. And, and that obviously is incorrect. I uh, think, uh, I think the food and cardio for these girls has probably more to do with them losing their cycle than, yeah the actual peds do i agree because like we were just talking before the podcast um and like how some girls are advised to eat really low cal and really high cardio for like months on end and like even if they're natural they have harder times getting their cycles back after the fact than the girls that didn't crash diet didn't do a lot of cardio but used peds um, I, at least that's what I've noticed, like anecdotally. Oh, I, because I, I, I have a pretty big stance that 
natural competing in the NPC and the IFBB is actually worse on the body than using responsible protocols, you know, because you will push your body so hard to try to even be competitive against an enhanced person, you'll end up causing more harm than you would have if you just used a little bit of something. Yeah, like I have a I have a girl right now in peak week and she just started her cycle. Oof. And she and like, it's like an upsetting Oof. thing. It's yeah, an upsetting rough. thing for the week of the show. But then I kind of told her I was like, "Well, doesn't it make you feel a little bit better that your body is not in complete whack? Like you know coming out of this competition now like you're, you're still in a pretty good state as far as like hormones go. Uh, she's yeah. a natural competitor, but um you know, just with diet breaks and things like that. And like, you know, her cows never got under a crazy amount or anything. And so, you know, it sucked, I think but you, I think, I think by the end of the week, she'll be fine. But, you know, luckily it started the day of peak week. So yeah, she she'll be, be okay. But, but I think you just made a great point, which, you know, it's starting to be talked about, but still very under the radar is diet breaks. You know, that, that right there could have been this one thing that kept her going and kept her metabolism, you know, in a healthy range or hormones in a healthy range was that you didn't try to do this linear progression of just less food, less food, less food, higher deficit, higher deficit, higher deficit. You paid attention to adaptations, gave her some diet breaks and stuff. And that's, that's what needs to be done. And that's like the new age approach that, I think more and more coaches are going to get into is um, possibly spreading out a prep a little bit longer, you know, for whatever reason, society always said a prep is 12 to 16 weeks. I don't know who decided that time frame. I don't know where this became the very enhanced male bodybuilders came up with that. (laughs) Yeah. It's It's like the official thing, like 16 weeks. That's all you need. No matter how fat you are, 16 weeks will get you there. Um, but I, and me personally, and I've seen other coaches talk about this, I'm starting to go for a much longer approach, but with itemized or strategized diet breaks within there. So if someone needs 16 weeks, maybe I'll do a 26-week prep with diet breaks in, in, in between there. And I'm sure people will watch this and say, 26 weeks, he's fucking crazy. But you're not understanding that we're literally stopping dieting for four to five days throughout that process. Yeah, that's something that a lot of us do from time to time, depending on the situation. Because I mean, that, I mean, dude, that was something that was super popularized by the natural community, Mm -hmm. you know, and all their stuff. But uh, I did want to, huh? They had to. They didn't have any other tools. Um, They were wasting away and turning into castrated skeletons by the time they were on stage. No, but I like what Dom said about how food and cardio, uh, low food and high cardio uh, can be a really big driver Uh, going back to the menstrual cycle thing. I think that's like where you really have problems, too, is if if females are losing their menstrual cycle and they're not even that lean yet or haven't lost a significant amount of body fat yet, like that, that's a problem. Oh, for sure. That's, that's that's red flags. That's that's danger sirens going off there. Like if they're and they're near a normal body fat percentage or, or yeah, yeah, because you can just be like, man, this is a long road ahead. If we're already having these these types of issues, this is going to be rough. Um, what's it going to be like? You know, twenty pounds from now. To my knowledge, there's like three big pieces that play into kind of the stress that drives amenorrhea. Low body fat is one of them, which is what most people focus on, but you're losing sight of the like energy availability, uh, which is, you know, how much are you eating and then how much activity are you doing? So if that's, you know, 66% of the equation, if we're just breaking into thirds, like that's a much bigger driver of the stress that causes amenorrhea than just having low body fat. Right. But people don't want to hear that because they don't want to stop. They're, They're addicted to that. Well, I got to get better so I can't stop cardio and I can't stop dieting, not realizing that that diet break will get them better, yeah. you know, or that you or, or just even reverse dieting uh, or pulling back cardio, you know, whatever it may be. But, yeah, I, I agree. I would say m- more so than 
the PEDs more so than the body fat percentage. It, it's it's the training and the diet that have the biggest effect by far. And for a whole nother episode, we could talk about the girls who don't even wait to get their cycle back before they jump into that next prep. Gotta jump that into that. Part. Yeah. Got to get it. All right, folks, we're coming up on an hour here. We might be over an hour. We waited a while to start this recording. There was a lot of bullshitting that went on before we officially hit that record button. And maybe one day, you know, maybe for like a nine ninety nine monthly pass, we'll give you access to the blooper maybe. reel. If you sign like an NDA or something that says like where you won't call 911 or the DEA or the FDA or the CDC or any of those bodies that'll get us all arrested. Uh, yeah. Matt, we want to say thanks again for coming on for part two. Uh, go ahead and, and do one more one more plug, one more reminder. When's that next course going to be? Where can they find information about it? Things like that. So, yeah, I mean, first, let me just say, you know, I appreciate you guys coming, uh, having me on again, and I'd love to be on again, so I won't ghost you guys, I promise. Um, but, uh, yeah, as far as my class, so the next one is actually this upcoming Sunday, um, 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, it's it's part one of our comprehensive blood work class. Um, we're going to, you know, cover comprehensive labs top to bottom, we're going to go over um, the differences between normal ranges and optimal ranges. And, uh, you know, something that we talked about in this podcast today, we're also going to go over how to properly prepare for lab work. Take a couple of days off from training, drink plenty of water. You know, there, there's steps to take in your lab work prep uh, to, to make sure that you're not having, you know, falsified numbers or anything like that. We want it as accurate as possible for women going at a certain time of the month because that's when hormones are going to be at their highest peak. Um, so comparing that, um, stuff like that, we're going to go over all that type of information and hopefully give people a better understanding of labs, not to discredit doctors or anything like that or tell people that they should avoid doctors, but just so that they can have a better understanding of their own health and kind of Take, take their health in, into their own hands a little bit more than, than previously. Love it. Love it. That blood work prep is huge. I think that's going to be massive value for people because that is just as important, if not more important than actually going out there and, and getting the bloods themselves. Uh, Paul, Dom, anything you want to leave the people with? No, I apologize for not talking too much today. We had workers at the house and uh, this guy, this guy is very defensive. He weighs a whopping 13 pounds, and uh, he's a very defensive dog. <laughs> 13 pounds of just pure rage. Yeah. I don't know what I did to him. I feed him. <laughs> I bathe him. I do everything for him. <laughs> and it's not enough. Paul? I'd like to apologize for talking too much. <laughs> probably speak less. It's never too much, Paul. And hey, we're all going around the bend with some apologies. I apologize for not being able to just get to the point of the goddamn question. I promise to stop adding so many qualifiers on future episodes. But until that future episode arrives, folks, thanks for coming. Thanks for watching. Do all that YouTube stuff. We'll see you on the next one. And in the meantime, stay gifted. Peace. Bye.